Lesson is on surrender. It's lesson number nine. It happens to be on page 19 in your workbook. If you have a workbook, there are extras in the back if you don't have one. Wonder, Tom Holiday, I wonder if you'd be leading to, sorry, willing to lead us in a prayer, an opening prayer? Could we give, get your mic? Uh, Terry, could you get the mic to Mike, to Tom? Sorry. It's easy for me to say. Go ahead. Let's pray. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so um, amazed by the grace that you extend to us. Uh, we, we oftentimes see ourselves as unlovable and um, with an inability to approach you and to, um, to receive the gifts that you have for us through Jesus. Help us to put that aside. Help us to um, see your love and your kindness and your forbearance and, and your willingness that we should return to you. And uh, that, that was manifested through your son who was sent for that purpose, to redeem us back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you for um, the teachers of this class, for the topic, and for the um, opportunities to consider your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. So... The word surrender is not found in the Bible. If you look and find it, let me know. I've looked and I haven't found it. Is the concept in the Bible absolutely 100% uh, throughout the Bible? Uh, if you look up a Britannica dictionary definition of surrender, I found to agree to stop fighting, hiding, resisting, etc., because you know that you will not win or succeed. I love it. I love it. Just park that in the back of your mind while we do a quick review of the class. We're talking about grace, and the two lenses we normally look through the Bible is, should be grace and justice. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're focusing primarily on the lens of grace during this class, but we acknowledge both are, are important, significant, and needed. Uh, in general, lesson one is the bad news, we can't stop sinning. We've talked about that. It's not possible. Lesson two is God's good news. The good news is that uh, is not that God will uh, save me despite my sin. Rather, it is that God's righteousness will be counted as my righteousness. My sin separates me from God, but God's, Christ's righteousness is counted as my righteousness. Lesson three is God's grace is sufficient. Uh, salvation will be by God's grace, not my effort or my strength. They are not sufficient to save me, but God's grace is sufficient. Lesson four is the price of grace. God's grace is not cheap. He did not wink at my sins. He paid for them with his son on a cross. The price of grace. Lesson five is relying on Jesus' grace today in our world, in our lifetime, as we live and as we confront sin and Satan and challenges in the world. Jesus Christ is the Word. He is God. In Him is life. He uh, does this right now with us and for us. He is the grace of God in our lives right now. Lesson uh, six, God's righteousness is not mine. Sorry, it's God's righteousness, not mine. Sorry. Wrong, wrong emphasis. Uh, some Christians think we are saved when our good outweighs our bad, but that is not true. We're saved by God's righteousness, not ours. Lesson seven is grace through faith, not through the law. We are saved by grace through faith, believing in Christ, who died to redeem us in order that the promise may rest on grace, not on works, not on some law keeping. And then the last lesson was lesson eight, which was a while back. <laughs> Several classes ago, we had the singing and we had the Q&A. Uh, God's power, not mine. We are never going to be good enough. I'm saying that for me. <laughs> i got to say it more often, though. Um, we are never going to be good enough. Being saved by grace means faith in Christ's goodness, <laughs> not our performance. <laughs> so give it up. It's not going to be. You're not going to be good enough. <laughs> so don't just... just just give it up. So that was uh, lesson eight. Tonight is lesson nine. Here's that definition I gave you. 
surrender, to agree to stop fighting, hiding, and resisting, etc. Because you know that you will not win or succeed. And then I found this other one in uh, Merriam Webster to give oneself over to something such as an influence, an intransitive verb, to give oneself up into the power of another. Interesting. To yield, to surrender. Keep that in mind as we go through this lesson. So let's read the case study. Uh, John, if you get a mic down here, raise your hand. Who's going to read the case study for me? John, quickly. Thank you. And then we're going to answer the questions. Uh, at the end, if you have a book, it's on Lesson 9, which is on page 19. You can read along with him or you can listen. This is a challenging lesson, I will say. Um, it's, it requires us to get a little uncomfortable. So uh, go ahead and begin the reading. It was a very sad moment. <clears throat> Stacy and Joy were in tears and Brother Simmons. It's not other... this Stacy now, just keep in mind. Oh. <laughs> Stacy and Joey were in tears, and Brother Simmons, an elder of their congregation, was certain they were sincere. Stacy and Joey were engaged and had been dating for a couple of years. They were waiting until they both graduated college to get married. That would be another two years. Sadly, they had been sexually active for about six months. Neither of them wanted that. They both knew it was wrong. They said they had fought it off for a long time. They had prayed about it, read scripture together, started going to gospel meetings and Bible studies as their dates. But when they got back to Stacy's apartment, things almost always turned sexual. They needed help and more prayer, so they were meeting with one of their elders. Brother Simmons was very understanding. They cried and prayed together. But then it came time for the advice. He said, well, guys, I see two options. Either get married now or quit being alone together. What? Joey said. There's nothing wrong with being alone. How can we get to know each other better if we aren't alone together? We just want God's way of escape so we'll stop having sex. Right, Brother Simmons responded. And this is the way of escape. Would you do these sexual things if Stacy's roommate was with you or if you were out with a group of people? Well, no, Joey replied. Then it seem, seems obvious. If you want to quit this sin, you need to quit being alone together in private places. They didn't spend too much time arguing about this with Brother Simmons. But when Joey dropped Stacy off at her apartment, he said he thought Brother Simmons was just wrong. There's nothing simple about us being alone together. He can't tell us that. I'm not buying it. I'll come on in tonight. We'll just pray harder and see if that helps. Sadly, this is a real life situation, I'm sure, for some. Um, and it's not hypothetical. And I think it's good that we confront what's going on here and talk about it as adults. So we'll begin with the first question. I'm sure you'll have lots of thoughts and questions and comments. Why wasn't this couple able to quit going too far sexually. Why were they not able to quit going too far? Raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic so that we can all hear and they can hear online as well. This couple was struggling with a lot of things. Got a hand up front here, gentlemen. I've got, hope I don't steal your thunder, Brandon. I've got that they weren't being honest about a number of things. But I don't want to take your. You didn't steal mine. Okay. Um, the way of escape is often inconvenient and intrusive, mm -hmm. and they didn't mm -hmm. want to be inconvenienced and yes. unable to <laughs> be alone together because, mm -hmm. honestly, it is a hassle to always have a third wheel. It is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, they were not dishonest. They were not being honest about their desires. They were not being honest with themselves or with God, but with themselves primarily. Another hand up. Debbie, go ahead. I had, um, because they had already sinned and went to the temptation and they liked it. <laughs> so, you know, Sadly, they were tempted I, and liked I it. I think that's true. Yeah. I, I think that would be honest for them to, to say, 
look, we're, we're enjoying it. We've experimented and we've enjoy, we're enjoying it. Uh, I, I've got that they were too confident in their own power over sin. I don't really know if they thought that because I think more it's more dishonesty with what's really going on myself. I don't think they were, I don't know if, it, I can't read their minds, so I don't want to be guilty of that. Gail's got her hand up. But I don't, I think primarily, it just they were just not being honest about to themselves what was going on. Gail, go ahead. Okay. Scripture says that God gives us a way of escape, mm -hmm. but we have to look for it and yes. use it. Mm -hmm. So it seems that they weren't really looking for it because they weren't being honest about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wanting yep. to look for it. Yes. I'm going to suggest, I agree with you, Gail, that they just really didn't want to quit sinning myself. I realize I'm kind of reading their heart and their mind, but there wasn't enough desire to do the right thing and listen to what this elder had to say. So wh wh wherever they fell on that, they weren't being honest about what was going on. Uh, number two, we're, we're going to have to squeeze all of this in tonight. We, don't have, we're not gonna, we can't work on this Sunday. How was legalism and self-reliance destroying them? So we've got legalism and self-reliance. So first you'd have to look at the story, of course, and say, okay, where's the legalism? And then you'd have to look at the self-reliance. I've already talked about, a little bit about the self-reliance. I think the others have as well. Uh, Debbie's got her hand up. So... The question is about legalism and self-reliance. How was it destroying the couple, at least in their relationship with God? Well, when they were given advice, which was pretty straight on, uh, he just he said uh, he thought that the elder was just wrong in saying there's nothing wrong about us being alone together. Well, that's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty, and, and they're being legalistic. Well, you can't, there's nothing in the Bible about not being alone together. That's true. You know, that's, and I could just hear them saying that, but he wasn't really trying to mm -hmm. find another way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. Thank you, well said. I don't know that I could anything to it. He just, he was just looking at what he wanted to see. Um, Joe? Well, yeah, they were substituting legalism for a way of escape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the, uh, uh, Self-reliance, which they clearly did not even have, yes, I agree. Is, is to say, well, let's just go on in and talk about it. Well, why did you bother uh, the elders' time? I mean, mm -hmm. you already made up your mind, so they had already developed a sense of, I guess you say in this case, false self-reliance, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that we can, we can abstain, which historically... Amen, thank you, I agree. Um, and I'm agreeing with all of those answers. Let's go ahead and do the last one. What do you think of this elder's advice to them? What do you think of his advice? He gave them advice. David's got his hand up. Uh, John. He gave them advice. They rejected it. What do you think about it? David, go ahead. Uh, that, that elder's advice, I thought that was very good advice. Either get married or stop being alone together. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. I agree. Debbie's got her hand up down here. Yeah, I, I think it was good advice. I, 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 don't, I can't find anything to, to criticize about it. I, I think he could have added some things. I think the advice he gave was good where it went. I think he could have added some things, but I think it was, it was solid advice. Debbie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they'd already been dating for, what, like a couple years, and they have two more to go. Obviously, it's not working. But I just wrote, um, what, do, you know, what do we think about the elders' advice? Well, obviously, they're not happy. They came to them. They're guilty. They're <laughs> sad. They're tearful. They're guilt-ridden. But they don't seem to want to change it. Hmm. So I just think, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of silly. They're given, they've been given advice about how to fix the situation, how to be, become a happy dating couple and be pleased with their relationship with God and with each other. But it seems like they want to continue to be miserable and guilt-ridden mm -hmm. and tearful and sad, and that doesn't look like much fun to me. Yes, there's, there's that thing when we get into sin. The, the pain we, we know is more comfortable than the pain of being honest and of, of you know, 
facing it. And we, we, there's some sayings about that. When we've got a pain and we've got a struggle with something, we've got to go through it. We can't go around it. We've got to go through it. And they didn't want to go through it. They, didn't, they just wanted to have their, well, I'm not going to go through that, but they just wanted to continue what they were doing. It, it appears, because he, Joey is just very, oh, no, no, we can do it. We'll just pray harder and see if that helps, and see if that helps. And I personally think he knew it wouldn't help, but that's, now that's an opinion. I, I'm just giving you my opinion. Um, Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Yes, please. Well, I wondered why maybe the uh, person they were talking to, the elder, didn't say, well, what is holding you back from getting married? You, you want to get married in two years. You're both in college. Mm -hmm. Go through it together. Mm -hmm. You know, that was never explored. What, what are the reasons that are keeping you from getting married? Yeah, I agree. I... I like you said, I guess it's the thing about college, not having the income or something. I, but it is, it, is, it is interesting that they, they rejected, essentially, both of his suggestions. Good point. I like that. Thank you. Um, uh, so w one option is that Joey didn't really understand, as I think Gail pointed out, that the way of escape meant surrendering something to God. To surrender this desire to satisfy the sexual desire that he had. So um, that seems to be absent with, with Joey and Stacy. So I've got something here I just want to, uh, that I found about this. Joey and Stacy decided they would continue to put themselves on a battlefield in which they had repeatedly been defeated and destroyed. They kept going back to that same battlefield. Surrender means acknowledging powerlessness. And that's what it means to be a Christian, is to, be, to admit that I'm powerless over sin without God and without Christ. But having submitted to sin, sin's become their master. They need to admit they don't have the power to overcome sin. That's why I said they, they weren't being honest. Accept it and mourn it. That's, that's fine. Be sad about it. We made a mistake. We didn't do the right thing. We can, we can, we can respond now in a, in a way of accepting the grace of Christ. Surrender to God and surrender their time alone. And they, they as Gail pointed out and others, that was, their, that was the way of escape that was available to them. And they didn't take advantage of it. Uh, let's go to the questions under the key passages. Uh, the first one concerns Matthew 26 and verse 39 and 51 through 54. I've got a reader that agreed to read it. Can you raise your hand so we get you a mic? Uh, Phil, can you give Phil a mic? We're going to read the passage. I think it's important to read the passage here. Uh, consider Matthew 26. Could Jesus have beaten Satan with his power and stayed off the cross? Explain your answer. Okay, Phil, go ahead and read it. Okay, and, he, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then the rest there. And then the rest of it is, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? Okay. Thank you, Phil. So the question is, considering that verse, could Jesus have beaten Satan with his power and stayed off the cross? I think there's going to be a diversity of answers. Phil, can we get a mic to Phil? Terry's coming. I, I think we need to be open to what, what, what our answers are. Yes, Phil. Yeah. He has to obey the Father's will. That's my problem, yes. That's the problem with it. Yeah. The, technically, does Jesus have the power? I think he does. And the authors kind of address this a little bit. We don't want to get all hung up on that. But I'm, I'm following where, where Phil is. Jesus always was submitting to his father. 
And that's what he says. Nevertheless, thy will be done. So that was a struggle for me to answer that question. I think, I, don't, I didn't reword the question ahead of time, but I think a better way to reword it might have been, um, did, did, could Jesus have moved on beyond that point without, uh, without dealing with it or something? I don't know. I, I, I just think the, my answer is, it was God's plan for Jesus to overcome Satan by offering himself as a sacrifice. And anything other than that, Jesus was never going to do. Now, that's my answer. I think if you answered yes, I, I have no problem with that. I think what you're saying is that does Jesus have the power to deal with Satan? And yes, he does. And I would just say as long as it's not conflicting with the will of his father. That, that's all I'm trying to say. So, Dwayne, do you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> Yes, he could have. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm, we're not, I'm not trying to be picky. I'm just trying to say I want to keep in mind that his will, the point of the lesson is this. He surrendered himself to his father, and he was willing to go through that pain, to go through the pain and not avoid the pain. Any other uh, answers that you want to give to that? When does class end? 7.40? Is that right? Okay. Times minus times five. Um, it was God's will that Jesus die on the cross for our sins. Anything short of that was not going to work. Jesus was never going to fall for that. Uh, he was always going to submit to his Father and never follow his own will. So for him to have brought down those legions of angels would mean he would have to be exercising his own will. I just didn't see that happening. I think technically he had power available to him, yes. But I, I just have a problem with his with this idea of will. Uh, his power came from his father, his father had already spoken. So we can move on to question number two. <laughs> I get too hung up on that. How did Jesus actually defeat Satan? And I think this is a good question. I think this is important. So raise your hand if you have an answer. How did Jesus actually defeat Satan? It wasn't by bringing 12 legions of angels down. We know that. It didn't happen. So how did Jesus defeat Satan? Debbie's got her hand up. How did Jesus actually defeat Satan? Dying on the cross? Yes. Amen. By actually submitting his will to his father and dying on the cross. Randy's got his hand up, uh, Terry, down here. Uh, oh, just somebody else say, okay. Uh, by submitting to death on the cross, he took on our sins and overcome the only weapon Satan has, which is death. He defeated Satan by submitting to his father. He had to change his will to match his father's will. That's how he overcame Satan. Yes, Randy. Yeah, it's, it's hard to think of a sin that doesn't have pride behind it. That's all about surrendering. It's all about pride. And Jesus, to me, defeated Satan by not allowing pride to mm. get in the way of following through with the mission that his father set out before him. Mm -hmm. That's what surrendering yes. is, is yes. not letting pride take over. Hmm. Maybe it was pride with uh, Joey and Stacy as well. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Randy. So he defeated Satan by doing what his father wanted, by, coming, by doing what he came to do on earth. Uh, the next one is going to be from 1 Corinthians 10, 12 for 13. We have a reader. Can you raise your hand? 1 Corinthians 10. Brandon, can you get a mic to Brandon? So the question while we're getting the mic to him is, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13, when will we fall and why do you think that is so? When will we fall? Why do you think that is so? Go ahead, Brandon. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so this is the way of escape. This is a, love this verse. The way of escape. Um, so, when will we fall, according to this passage? When will we fall? Notice, it assumes the truth of the question in the question. Brandon's got his hand up, Terry. When will we fall? I think it's an easy answer. I don't know, maybe not. I, I think it's an easy answer. When we think that we won't fall. <laughs> yes. Well said. That's better than what I was going to say. 
But I was going to say, when we believe we're, we, we're really doing well, I've got this, I'm really faithful, and I'm standing on my own. Now, I don't know if everybody says that, but that's what it sounds like. Uh, it's when we have a misplaced confidence in our own security. <laughs> Take heed you stand, lest you fall. Take heed how you think you're standing. Uh, God is always faithful. Phil's been good about this. In our relationship, God keeps his part of the relationship always. We're the ones that struggle to be faithful. We're the ones that struggle to, to be faithful. God is always faithful. So be careful when we think things are going really well. Just be really careful. Uh, another way to look at it, like you says, when we think we won't fall, when we think we can handle it ourselves. Let's go to the next question, number four. How did Paul claim we could overcome sin? So we've established that we have to be careful that we can fall. So how did Paul uh, claim we could overcome falling from grace? That's sin. How could we overcome sin? Joe's got his hand up. Get your mic. By taking advantage of the uh, way of escape. Yes, yes. So Thank not you. not just a way of escape, but taking advantage mm -hmm. of it. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of the reading I was doing, uh, the, using the way of escape. They said, "Can you imagine an army that's you know that's on a mountain somewhere, and it's being attacked, and there's a path that takes them right to where they want to go." And they say, no, no, we don't want to do that. We'll miss whatever. We're not going to take that way of escape. You and I listen to that, we go, this doesn't make any sense. But I have to be honest. I sometimes do that myself. I look at the way of escape and I go, oh, no, I want to do this thing. I don't want to take that way of escape. It'll be so good, whatever it is that I think I want to do. Um, Paul said, no temptation is too great. We can bear all temptations through Christ who strengthens us. God will provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. He'll provide a way out so we can stand up under it. He's going to walk with us. He's not going to take the temptations away, but he'll provide a way of escape. We're going to be tempted. Uh, let's go to the next question, number five. According to Romans 13, 14, who's my reader for Romans 13? Mike? Somebody get a, a microphone to Mike. A mic to Mike. Um, uh, uh, according to Romans 13, 14, what will hinder us from surrendering to God's way of escape and why? So what will hinder us from surrendering? Mike, go ahead. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. And make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well said. So what will hinder us from surrendering to God's way of escape? Bobby's got his hand up. What will hinder us from uh, surrendering to God's way of escape and why? Why will that hinder us? Bobby, go ahead. I think our actually desires and... Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes, like Brandon alluded to, I think the way of escape sometimes is very inconvenient, or we don't want to do it, or we think we can do it like a different way. And I think that runs hand in hand, like at least in my, mm -hmm. in my, sense, like in my own experience. I think sometimes I don't want to do that. You know? Yes. Well, I had, a, I had a different plan, God. I had a different idea. It wasn't going to work like that. It's going to be embarrassing, or it's going to be hard, or it's going to be sad. Um, well, one way, is there, oh, sorry. Certainly. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, one way that would hinder us from surrendering to God's way of escape is thinking, dwelling upon how to gratify our sinful nature. Yes. And the other one is yes. just not thinking about how the sin is displeasing to God and harmful to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of where you put your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And Bill had a good lesson. Phil's got his hand up. Bill had some good lessons on that, uh, make no provision for the flesh. I appreciated his lessons on that. They were right on, and they, were, they, were, they spoke to me, and I appreciated that. You don't, don't make the plan. 
don't make the plan. Phil, go ahead. Yeah, I, surrendering has two parts to it. There's an external part, which is the outward part, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then there's the inward part. Mm -hmm, true. Part of the reason we legalism stresses the outward part. <laughs> That's what it does. Mm -hmm. But it does so with the false assumption that you can do it without your heart. Mm -hmm. That's what legalism really tries to mm -hmm. do. It says, mm -hmm. I don't need help. When we get baptized to Christ and unite with him in that, yes. what we're saying is, I need your help. Yes, I can't do it without you. Mm -hmm. But secondly, what we're really doing is we're turning our heart over to God. And now Jesus lives in the inner sanctum of our heart. Yes. He yes. makes the decisions for us mm -hmm. that we used to make for ourselves. So instead of making my own decision to sin, now I, make, I let Jesus make that decision for me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to practice righteousness mm -hmm. instead. Mm -hmm. And that's where the battle has to be won. Yes. It yes. doesn't start with the flesh. It starts with the heart. Yes. Amen. It's living in Christ and Christ living in me. It's the power of Christ in me. And there is a power of Christ available to each one of us in us. But we deny it when we when we ignore this way of escape. We just want to do it our own way. We want to do it ourselves. And we're just denying the power of Christ available to us. Living in Christ. He says, uh, just yeah, put on the Lord Jesus. It's like putting on a coat. It's cold tonight. So a lot of y'all have a coat or a sweater. It's just like putting on that coat or the sweater. I'm going to put on Jesus Christ. Walk with me. Go with me, Jesus. It's your power, not mine. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, when we think about how to gratify the sins of the flesh, if we continue to hold on to certain sins. There's other verses that talk about that. We want to hold on to certain sins. I know nobody in here would do that. I know I have done that. If we continue to hold on to certain sins and plan to enjoy them, um, then we are not surrendering to God and his way of escape. Uh, that's why I think the elder's advice has merit. I think it's a good advice, what he said. The next passage is Galatians 2 and 20. Uh, I have a reader for that. I can't remember who it was. Joe Rimmer, could you get a mic to Joe? So the question is, what is surrendering to Christ according to this passage? Galatians 2.20. What is surrendering to Christ? Go ahead, Joe. Do you want me to read both of the verses? Yes, please. Sure. Sorry, yes. You're, it's fine. Galatians 2.20-21. 20 I have been crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. It is no longer I who live, mm -hmm. but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by... The uh, live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Mm -hmm. Paul said, it's no longer I who live. As, as Phil said, it should be Christ living in me. The life I now live in the flesh, ideally it's by faith in the Son of God. <laughs> but we want to do it our way, you know how that is. So, I'm sorry, I'm answering the question, but anyway, I still want to hear what you have to say. So, what is surrendering to Christ according to this passage? Raise your hand, we'll get you a mic. What is surrendering to Christ? Jeff's got his hand up. What is surrendering to Christ? Living for Christ and not ourselves, um, which is what Christ demonstrated when he came. He lived for God, not for himself. Mm -hmm. He didn't do what he wanted to do, he did what God wanted to do. So, mm -hmm. we need to do the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Um, when it is no longer my own fleshly desires that live in me, but Christ lives in me. When it is no longer my relationship with the world and the things of the world, that's the most important. What was the most important thing for Joey in this story? And Stacy, I'm not, I'm not, I'm picking on Joey because he's a guy and it's easy for picking on the guys. But what was the most important thing to Joey in this story? What's that? Just, just say it. What? Joe? Yeah. Spending time alone. Yes, spending time alone. It wasn't putting on Christ. It wasn't being crucified with Christ. Yes, I'm picking on Joey. I'm, I'm sorry for their mistake, and I know it happens, but that's what we're here to do, is to learn from the mistakes these people have made. Um, so when it's no longer my relationship with the world, and the things of the world is important, but my relationship with God that's important. That's what I'm trying to remember. It's when that's my relationship with God. Crucifying yourself and allowing Christ to live in you through faith. Through faith in him. Always remember that Jesus surrendered to his Father's will and died for you. And then the last question in this section, according to Galatians 2, 20 and 21, 
How does our surrender verify God's grace in our lives? Good question. How does our surrender verify God's grace? We're here talking about grace. That's our subject. So how does our surrender verify God's grace in our lives? You ever think about that? I never thought about that until this lesson. Uh, give her a mic, please, so everybody can hear us. It sounds good. I just want to make sure everybody gets to hear it. Because he forgives us. Okay. Can you add to that anything? You don't have to. I'm just, can you? Because he forgives us for praise when we sin. He gives us praise. Okay. Would you repeat that on the mic so that the people at home listen? <laughs> he forgives us. Yes, he does. And I don't remember the rest of what I said. And, he, <laughs> and as he forgives us. Oh, through grace. For grace, yes. Yes, thank you. Well said. Yes, so as we surrender, uh, Dwayne's got his hand up, somebody. So as we surrender, then we're, we're, we're saying, okay, look, I want God's grace in my life. Yes, Dwayne. Yeah, when we surrender, it is our acknowledgement <coughs> that we understand the reality that we can't do it on our own. And mm -hmm. I just go back to Naaman when he finally surrendered yes. and submitted himself and dipped seven times in the Jordan <laughs> River. He received God's grace. So yes. it's, when we surrender to God and do what he says, we're acknowledging, I, I failed, I can't do this on my I'm own, powerless. and I know yeah. that you're the only one that can mm -hmm. help me do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well said. So we're almost out of time. Uh, we're going to pass these three questions, and I'm going to read this. Jesus did not use his power to avoid the cross, even though he didn't want to drink that cup. Instead, he surrendered to the Father and was crucified. We can only win the battle against sin if we follow Jesus' example. Instead of using our power, we need to crucify uh, ourselves with, with Jesus, uh, letting him live in us, surrendering to his grace in the Father's way of escape. Uh, Sunday, December 10th, is Dwayne's going to be teaching Keeping Pure Grace. It's Lesson 10 on the 10th. You can remember that. Lesson 10 on the 10th. Go ahead and ring the bell. Thank you. Very appreciate your participation.